Hey everybody, welcome back to Terminus. Uh, I am the Death Metal Guy, aka an Amazon delivery drone shocking you in the genitals forever. And I am the Black Metal Guy, aka Anthony Fantano, IQ75. <laughs> uh, here to tell you that the beats are loud and the... Uh, the production is and raw is and heavy. grimy and intense. You know, there's a real, a real kind of energy to this music. Uh, <laughs> a lot of those sort of, a lot of those slow sludge riffs and some of those, some of those hardcore breakdowns, which I got mixed feelings about. Um, this is because we we, we watched uh, a, we watched a review of Zabalba by him together, right? <laughs> we went back night. to yeah, I think it was to which one was that? Was that uh, it was the first one? Uh, yeah. It, or, it, my God, yeah. It was uh, yeah, it was Oslo Muerte, yeah. It was like the the yes the uh, it had some of those. It was really astonishing. I can't remember what what. He basically just said that it was loud and it was low and heavy. Yeah, that's most of his oh, reviews yes. of uh, metal stuff. So, yeah. or it's, uh, it's high not... and fast if it's black metal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Um, so, so that's that's the angle we're going to be taking on future Terminus reviews. Uh, Definitely. Our goal yeah. Is to get seventy million subscribers. <laughs> um, so. Uh, one thing we've thought of is uh, oh one thing while I remember it uh, I've uh, we've been a little slow on uploads especially for the YouTubes the last couple of weeks this is because my computer does not have the uh, the storage to do what it needs to do in terms of churning out the uh, nice looking videos with the slideshow of album covers uh, so eventually that will get changed. But for now, we're probably just going to go with either much simpler versions of those videos, maybe one cover per, or just the automated Podbean videos, and try to get the episodes out to you sooner. So, I'm sure you're not um, going to lose. You, ha I'm sure you haven't been losing any sleep over that. If you see a slight <laughs> dip in video quality, that's why. Um. Uh, anyway, we thought we'd try a new sort of new format for the beginning of the show, which is uh, integrating the intro banter around Terminus news. Because at this point, we've got people in the uh, the Terminus world uh, <laughs> asking us to cover stuff that uh, <laughs> we don't have time to cover. The greater Terminus co-prosperity sphere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we've actually uh, we got a couple cool things this time. Terminus economics, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the NATO of extreme metal podcasts. Shit, I forgot to say one up front. So there you go, the NATO of oh, extreme shit. metal podcasts. Oh shit! Was the NATO of extreme metal podcasts. Yes. Um, <laughs> so we got a couple cool uh, ones uh, this time. Uh, first off, our buddy uh, is it presumptuous to say buddy yet? That uh, no, uh, we're, no, we, he's our buddy. Yeah, yeah uh, forlorn spirit from Old Dewan Gash has uh, recently started his own little tape label uh, called Feral Heart Productions. And uh, he has just released... Uh, he's done a uh, a tape edition of the Old Wan Gash album, Hubris Unchained, but he's also cracked out a, a couple demo tapes from some other stuff, and uh, we're going to be showing them off uh, this week and next week. So what have we got the uh, the first time around? Uh, I figure first time around we'd go with um, another one of his projects, which is uh, Desert Eagle. Uh, this is the Festering Wound demo. Um, it's got, in case you were worried, it's got an eagle on the cover. Phew. I, I like um, the idea that it can uh, be either one. <laughs> exactly. It's both. It's both. It's a... Uh, that's a poetic image. Um, and uh, we can read his description. That's better than anything we could do. Yeah. 20 minutes of epic, stomping, street rock, black metal. Desert Eagle is a new nom de guerre of Old One Gash in the war against modern times. You can sort of imagine how this sounds already, but you actually probably can't. Um, yeah, it so is definitely... It's, it's different. Definitely very different from Old One. So... Yeah, um... Yeah, so this is let's a, go to... Yeah, this is a four untitled tracks, so we're just going to listen to a little sample off the second one, I believe, and just to kind of show this uh -huh. off for people. Yeah. 
think that was the whole track. Yeah, that was that was at least most of it. But uh, yeah, no, this uh, this is definitely cool. It's it's very different from Old Juan Gash. I mean, this is a lot more like a, I don't know, a forefather by way of Bill Skernier, I would call it, or something like that. Definitely sounds like Bill Skernier. Um, sounds I could hear the forefather thing. Really reminds me of a couple things that I'd be interested to hear if this guy is uh, Forlorn Spirit. Are you into Flea and Sturm? Uh, do you like Chaos Brutet? Um, because this sort of like really densely, he's got two or three frantic harmonic parts going at once, which is the mm-hmm. thing I really like. Dude, that brass synth we both loved. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. Uh, the other thing that reminds me of that I bet he likes is Vulcanas. Uh, I don't know that at all. Which sounds just really ancient and gorked and bizarre. It's pretty. <laughs> it's pretty cool shit. Yeah, you'd you'd probably appreciate it. Um, all right, cool. But uh. Yeah, that's fucking epic. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll take a look at the uh, the other demo that he's released uh, next week. But uh, just to keep things moving, we gotta keep all of our friends <laughs> taken care mm-hmm. of. So we've also got a uh, a new release by Old Mill, you know, our buddy over there. And uh, this is actually a a compilation benefit album. And uh, just to read off the description. The proceeds of this compilation will be donated in their entirety to the Lindsay Academy Theater, a culturally and historically priceless institution for the performing arts in my hometown. As the past is smothered by the new world, protect the flowers that still grow in the concrete. So, uh, yeah, this is a... Uh, a Aw, 14... Reese. Aw, Reese. Such a sweet boy. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, this is really in keeping with uh, you know a lot of the things that Old Mill talks about, kind of like uh, taking care of your local community, and you know he actually puts his money where his mouth is and he's donating the proceeds. So a lot of the stuff on this compilation is going to be uh, friends of his, uh, some bands that he's released on the label, things like that. So we figured we would just do uh, a quick sample off uh, one of the bands that you're more familiar with. So who is this? Oh wait, which one? Oh oh yeah 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 um. This is you. This is a project, I think, from the, you'd probably call it the Midwest. I might call it the West. Someplace near, someplace on the Mississippi, in that mm-hmm. that, that region of the world. Um, yeah. I can't remember exactly where. Some plain state. And uh, it is, well, uh, you'll hear. <laughs> All right. This, this is from about a minute into the U track, Cloven. All right, let's try it. kind of the the perfect synthesis of like uh, americana and kind of euro neo folk isn't it it is yeah it really is that was the thing that needed to happen i think well i mean you know it was done back in the day by like um uh, who is it i mean woven hand has done that and and who, what the, what's the band horsepower uh 16 horsepower uh back in the day but like this is much more uh industrial and atmospheric and spacious than those bands. This is, yeah, I think it's really cool. Sounds like the High Plains. 
Yeah, definitely. I'd uh, be interested in checking some more out by that guy. So if you guys want to check that out, just go over to the uh, Old Mill Artifacts band camp. It is uh, pay what you want, but remember, it's charity. You know, just get, give him some money. You know, he's trying to he's trying to yeah. help out his local town. So well, uh, let me real quick. Let me also mention the bands that we've covered that are on here mm-hmm. or that are in Terminus Orbit. Uh, sure. So Halia Runa, um, Skumringsheim. God, really, really sick track. Just like instant, instant caffeine pill or just whatever <laughs> other drug of choice is. Uh, pl- uh, we've played that at the end of the Old Mill interview. Uh, Mulder Yawn, The Everwoods, and What Lie Neath Its Shade. Great band. We reviewed that on, I think, Terminus 14 sometime back in the day. Something uh, like that. Yeah. Um, Soldier Tower is we haven't covered here, but I have that on Bandcamp. That is that guy is batshit insane. Highly recommended. <laughs> uh, Tana Hanner as and Robes of Snow have also come up in the uh, Old Mill interview. Yeah, and so, uh, just looking at it, it looks like there's a, a couple actual uh, friends of mine from back in the day on here. So, uh, but that's a secret for me. <laughs> ooh, ooh, alrighty. So uh, as usual. Uh, if you like what we're doing and you want to keep abreast of kind of the latest things that are going on for Terminus, we are unfortunately on social media. Uh, as usual, I am handling the Facebook side of things over at Terminus Podcast, and the Black Metal Guy is handling the Instagram at Terminus Extreme Metal. And uh, it's important that you follow us on those things, and it's also important if you're really invested to. Uh, See about maybe helping us out on either Patreon or Subscribestar, where uh, you can help support the uh, the further development of the Terminus Co Prosperity Sphere, and uh, also uh, get some little benefits here and there. You know, uh, being able to access our Terminus Prime bonus episodes, as well as entry to the Terminus Black Circle, our uh, weird little Discord server, where we talk about new metal and uh, forgotten black metal classics. And now, the important thing about this we wanted to make clear is as the uh, research chemical addicted ghouls of Silicon Valley uh, further advance their <laughs> mission to consolidate all internet media within the uh, Facebook Google duopoly, uh, it becomes more and more difficult for small content creators like us to be able to do what we want. You know, uh, obviously we are uh, we are guys who are working full time doing this for love, but we would definitely love to scale that down. And because of the nature of what we do, ad revenue is just off the table. We get copyright struck yeah. on YouTube or a uh, copyright claim. Sorry, I wrote struck in the notes. That's my fault. Okay, well, if you, don't worry. Difference. You get enough claims, yeah. they become strikes. So we'll, we'll get there eventually. <laughs> But yeah, so really. Oh, oh joy! Yes. Well, so really. Yeah, then, oh well, then we get a copyright claim on every single thing we post. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Mm. I mean, we'll get there. And I have I appealed one of them, and on they said no. reasonable fair yeah. use grounds, and they were just like, "No, fuck you." No, dude, fair <laughs> use is only for people with a hundred thousand subs, man. That's where if you get to use fair use. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, in essence, you know, the the whole way that we are supported, you know, uh, since a lot of the standard avenues of monetization just aren't available to us, is from people like you who are listening. Uh, we got a good block of patrons already, all of whom are pretty awesome people. We really like talking to them uh, on the Discord, and you know we'd love to get some more people involved and just kind of grow this little uh, this little niche community that we've kind of started here. Yeah, we've been we've been very lucky with patrons so far. I think we're uh, financially outperforming our expectations, and certainly the expectations of the people around us who said, "Don't go into extreme metal podcasting." <laughs> um, but but we we were drawn to it inexorably like an open grave. You know? <laughs> uh, the gods showed me in a dream. They said that this was your destiny to pick up the hammer and yes. talk about black metal tapes for three hours at a time for the rest of your life. <laughs> Somebody must smite the posers. So, yeah. Um, so, but yeah, thanks a lot for everyone who's uh, who's uh, kind of subscribing and donating to us so far. And uh, if you guys like this content, and you want to hear more, we would love to be able to expand. Uh, just uh, consider throwing us a few bucks. But speaking of ruining our lives, listening to black metal tapes, we got another block of four records for today, and uh, this is a first for us because all of these were sent to us personally by bands 
or uh, are friends of people that we've covered before, which is kind of cool. You know, we're, we're finally reaching that point of saturation, so <laughs> where we don't have to find yeah, things although anymore. Just for the record, just for the record, for the listeners, it's never going to be all like people we know. We're always going to be hunting for new shit for you. And oh yeah, yeah. Here to the ground. And we're going to be following the promo cycle and trying to keep an eye out for the weirdest shit that flies under that on tape only labels. <laughs> yeah, on yeah. Internet. And so, uh, no we've worries got... about that. But this time, it's, this time it is Terminus Crew. Yeah, this is total Terminus Crew. So uh, opening up, um, actually, uh, kind of reaching out through, ironically, forlorn spirit from Old Wong Gash. We have the new uh, EP. It's going to be a twelve-inch EP. Uh, by Carved Cross, who, uh, if you're not familiar with, are a a pretty uh, a pretty important kind of cult DSBM crew out of Tasmania, uh, who've been around for a few years, and that record is getting released on their internal label Overuse, that puts out a lot of Carved Cross and affiliated projects, and then after that, very very swift change. We have a record by some friends of mine who I know personally and have played with in the past. This is a band called Trash with the uh, debut full-length Forbidden Rights uh, released independently uh, on CD and uh, digitally on Bandcamp. So uh, what have you got for us today? Well, uh, second half of the show is going to be a sort of uh, Southeast Asian uh, ex- black metal extravaganza. Um <laughs> We've got, uh, first we've got a band th- that was brought to our attention by our friends in Elcrost, who we reviewed a few weeks back. Elcrost is a Vietnamese kind of like gothic black death band. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Is that accurate? Yeah, kind of gothic proggy, kind of blacky, um, kind of goth. This is yeah. their fr- Yeah, they said they said we, there's a small scene here in Vietnam, but uh, we know one guy who's like really cult who we play shows with, and his name is his band is Vong, and so I checked it out, and this is fantastic. Yeah, so Vong, a wanderer in liminality, it's going to get a uh, very nice tape, hard copy issue on Analog Ragnarok tapes, uh, and then after that, uh, the guys in a band called War Cult contacted me. War Cult with a uh, war with a K and a V. <laughs> the uh, they are uh, all one word. They are from Bandung, Indonesia, uh, and this is their this is their record, Death Hymn, which is out on Sadist Records and I believe Cult of Belial, who we've covered before. Um, mm-hmm. So, so See. that will be Vong is like black metal black metal down the line war cult is as you might imagine war black metal (laughs) it absolutely is okay so first off uh carved cross embittered amidst the ashes so i I gotta say this was this was a a life-affirming moment when this guy reached out it's like hey you know i'm friends with forlorn spirit i've got a band called carved cross uh we've got a a new record coming out pretty soon Uh, would you like to cover that on the show because he really liked uh, what we did with old one gash and i was like Mm -hmm. fuck yeah carved cross i want to cover that yes thank you because i've actually been a, a huge carved cross fan for probably five or six years maybe a little bit longer mm-hmm. uh, i mean because i remember listening to their first few tapes when they were coming out around 2012 or 2013 and i think you pretty much just know them through me right yeah you've talked about this project constantly possibly since before we started terminus Oh yeah, <laughs> long before it's like a standard. Terms. It's a standard reference point for you. And, oh uh, yeah, it is. This is, I would say that this is one of the only things that are popular now, and that sell a lot of tapes that um you also really like. Yeah, that's true. So, for a little bit of history, uh, Carved Cross is sort of the main project of a collective of Tasmanian musicians who have between each other been involved in probably you know a dozen or more different projects usually black metal sometimes doom sometimes kind of punk or noise stuff and uh, Mm. a lot of this used to center around a label you might remember called winter reich records 
God, that could be anything. No, I, I, I don't. What, what did they put out? Oh, Winter Reich. Well, I mean, it was mostly just the stuff from that Tasmanian scene, as well as like a few, I think, a few mainland Australian releases. But uh, I'm not sure if Winter Reich is still going, but now uh, one of the members has Overuse, kind of their in house label that they're publishing everything on. And uh, they've become a sort of touchstone for the Tasmanian scene. Um, which, you know, also has other people participating in it. Like, uh, you know, obviously the biggest known band would be Psychroptic. Um, and then mm-hmm. within the black metal realm, the biggest guy would be Stryborg, who I also enjoy a lot. Um, but uh, these guys kind of have their own little cluster, their own little nucleus of creative ideas. And a lot of the music is, between these different projects, is touching on similar ideas of very raw, extreme black metal very raw, noisy punk music, as well as kind of a thread of ambient and electronic stuff through all of it. So Carved Cross in particular, you could call a, a like depressive black metal band in a fashion, but it accesses a very different kind of musical lineage. Would you say that's fair? Because in, because they've admitted in an interview and other people have mentioned this, that the way this music behaves is much more like minimal electronic music than black metal, in a sense. I hear that for sure. Um, It's, yeah, is it like DSBM? I mean, only insofar as some DSBM verges on that, right? Uh, Yeah. It's definitely not like um, dramatic or histrionic music. No, it's Uh, very subdued. And it's it's extremely unsent, it's like, as far as this stuff goes, it's not really sentimental at all. No, not at uh, all. Yeah, um, it's a uh, very kind of objective music, which I appreciate. Very impersonal. Um, yeah, I'm kind of curious about your your overall impressions, just because I think I've showed you samples of these guys in the past, but this is your first time listening to a whole release, uh, if I'm correct. Yeah, I, I don't know. I can't. I probably won't listen to it again. Uh, but it's. Just it's you know it's just a little it's slow for me. Um, yeah, it's definitely slow but, music. <laughs> but I think I like it. I I was uh, um. Yeah, I I based on how you described it, I thought I'd be less into it. Mm-hmm. I think they're basically. I think as far as things they're drawing on, I think they're probably drawing on a number of things I like, or or at least are related to a number of things I like, like. A lot of the guitar riffing sounds more like Lycia than a, uh, which is called, people call that dark wave, although what, it's just a, I, I don't know how that label affixed itself to them. It's just goth from the late 80s, early 90s. Mm-hmm. Um, very atmospheric haunting stuff that I think was also big for people like Catatonia and all that. Um, but uh, yeah, it reminds me of that. I hear the minimal electronic thing for sure. Uh, and, um, I, yeah, I, I, I like how it doesn't sound... there. It doesn't sound like there's a person being sad here. Yeah. Yeah, which is... And I... I, I think some I of the... I like that kind... Some of the earlier Carved Cross stuff is a little bit more traditionally kind of sad sounding, in a way. Mm-hmm. And the these guys do have a real mastery of how do we make these simple, elemental kind of... I mean, a lot of the, uh, you really touch it on something with the Lycia, a lot of these are more like goth melodies than yeah. depressive black metal melodies. But they've, they've got a... shoegaze melodies. Yeah, but they've got a real intuitive... Like in a real sense. Yeah, they've got a real intuitive knowledge of how do we make one of these incredibly simple three-chord strummed riffs something elemental and powerful. Yeah, I do like the extreme minimalism of it, too. Yeah, it's, I, it's, I, it's rigorous. You know, yeah. <laughs> I, it's definitely rigorous. Yeah, it's definitely the uh, the opposite the the opposite number of the war cult that we got at the end of the show. Oh yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, let's uh let's jump in with some samples and start talking about and picking it apart. Mm-hmm. So, uh, this is basically a it's a four track EP. You got three long tracks and then kind of a short kind of noise ambient piece at the end, um, which is good. But obviously, we're going to be concentrating on the bulk of it. And both of us ended up kind of selecting the same part off the first track, Hope Cascades Into Eternity. So I'll play part of it, and then we'll pick up 
with your thoughts on the back end of that and kind of talk about what we're detecting here. Yeah, so that's really interesting. I mean, there's been all these um, black metal and black metal adjacent bands in recent years that have been picking up on, you know, incorporating major key stuff. And that's what's occurring here is the, the bulk of that is kind of a major key melody, but it's completely different in context for most because most of, you know, they're using these major key melodies as these sort of emotional exclamation points of triumph and stuff like this. This is a very dark major key melody. You know, it's it's sort of like curious and searching, and uh, it doesn't give you that feeling of, you know, ecstatic triumph that a lot of other black metal bands try to cultivate with similar ideas. It falls off a bit at the end. Da, da, da. Da, da, da. Yeah, it's it like definitely, you know what it's you know what it's kind of like it's kind of like really early M eighty three. Yeah, I guess that would be fair. We, yeah. Like their stuff before they had vocalists or anything, even like when it or went before he had vocalists. Yeah, yeah, because there was this. I, it only came to my mind because I went back and listened to it the other day, and I was like, after like ten years, and I was like, God, this is really good. Well, yeah, there was kind of a nexus of, uh, you know, it never really formed as a style, but sort of like, especially in England, shoegaze and electronic people trading ideas back and forth. And something kind of emerged from that, a certain sort of musical vocabulary, and also, you know, related to the goth scene at the same time. Um, yeah, yeah, that particular melody is very early 90s UK. I mean... Yeah, Slow Dive used a lot of electronic stuff for sure, especially later on. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it could also be a Britpop melody. Like, I mean, there's there's stuff like Ride, which is kind of um, on the edge between Britpop and the shoegaze or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, that almost sounds... And Ride has this kind of blissed out, but very minimal kind of bleak a attitude to it. It's a very is... interesting mood. I think that's what interests me most about this record is the... Mm -hmm. The mood is very distinct, but I don't think I've really heard it before. You know, it's not... It's in this very liminal space between happiness and sadness. Um, and it's very hard to articulate exactly what that feels like. You know, there's a sort of a, a sense of almost resignation to it, you know? Yeah, sort of release via resignation or... Also, the drums, right, are really uh, unique. So I think I know how you'll answer this. Uh, mm -hmm. This isn't like a trick question, but um, you really disliked the minimal drumming on the Nile invocation we listened to a few weeks ago. Yeah. In a lot of ways, this is by far the most similar drumming to that that we've heard on this show. What well, I'd sets agree. it apart? What sets well, it apart? Well, what sets it apart, honestly, a lot of it is there's a lot of heavy lifting in this music done by the production and the mixing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I read mm -hmm. uh, some interviews with one of the members, uh, I believe, 
uh, this would be a few years back, where he talked about how the the mixing and the production process is another whole part of the music. Like it's it's so transformative from the raw ingredients that the the production itself is an instrument. And I think there's I can hear that. That's almost the main instrument here. Yeah, there's so much depth in the production here, and there's so much kind of swirling pretty kind of noise going on and so many layers of sound in that that you can pull out that the minimal drumming that just kind of propels it works whereas for Nile Invocation you didn't really have that kick from the production it felt very kind of bare in a way yeah I think there's also something specific about what the drumming is doing although there's a lot of um very very simple just kind of thumpy beats that's a it's it's itself is an idiosyncratic beat Mm -hmm. it's not it doesn't really have anything to do with the black metal beat per se except that it's very repetitive right yeah it's kind of got this trudging thunk Mm -hmm. mm-hmm thunk thunk um and this sort of it has a little more energy to it, I think, than that other kind of drumming. I can hear that it has more energy to it. There's a little more space filled in. Yeah. But it's not like conventional drumming energy. Well, we also get to a, a very cool drumming part at the end of my sample where uh, where yours picks up from. So do we want to listen to the next half of that and then uh, kind of yeah, talk about that? Yeah, that's what I was trying to get go into. Because, yeah, here, here the drums get a little more exciting. Okay, um, so uh, just picking up right where we left off. some of that like major key to create dissonance thing for sure yeah definitely and uh i really like the uh the switch over to that little um 16th run on the hi-hat that the drummer is doing you know he's not he's not changing the fundamental maybe that's what makes it so interesting the the drumming performance he's keeping that just that that solemn like bass and uh, snare mm-hmm. stomp beat going on but then mm-hmm. let's create texture between that with, uh, you know, just running hard on the hi-hat or things like that. It's it's operating more like a melodic instrument. Like when we talk about Defeated Sanity, about how there's an inherent musicality to the way mm-hmm. that he plays drums, there's a, a much more minimal version of that happening here. Yeah, this is definitely symbols to the fore. Mm-hmm. I hear that. Um, uh and the cymbals work in the same space as the washes of noise from the guitars and everything. Right? Yeah. Um, and in the same space yeah. as the vocals, which just sort of howl in the background. You know, they don't really have a lot of rhythmic property to them. It's all about this kind of swirl coming together. Yeah. So I think, yeah. And I think this is about the point where my ears really pricked up listening to this because that's like, you know, I, I, I like music where there's like, not a lot of variation and then small changes make a huge difference right Mm -hmm. and this was a one of those sort of like big shifts in it um another thing that i think i picked up on is the the pick scrapes 
Like, right? So, like, as he starts tremming 16th notes, you start to hear... Yeah, you've got... It's got that hollow twang of, like, following the voice of blood. That's true, but, like, the pick... Can you hear the scrape itself? Yeah, yeah, I can. Because it's it's the, kind of... The weird... It's so reverbed out that the scrape has its own kind of white noise effect to it. Yeah. So I yeah. Was, you know more about production than I do. do. Were they? Do you think he mic'd those separately to pick them up better? I think that what we're hearing is uh, I'm not super confident just because it is pretty low-fi, even though it's clearly an advanced kind of production job. I think what we're hearing is a a couple different layers of guitar. We've got a, uh, that twangy one up front, and then we've got a, a very subdued and so delayed and washed out, it's, they're barely notes anymore, kind of wash uh, further in the background. But there's a lot of strange stuff where uh, the reverb is picking up on very odd overtones. Like, I remember we were talking about that, some older stuff that I made, where it's like, the reverb is so blown out, it's kind of creating these ghost harmonies that don't actually exist. They're just like kind of illusions yeah. of the frequencies. And I think that's some of what we're hearing here. Dude, illusions of the frequencies is going to be my acid techno record. <laughs> that wouldn't be a bad one. Uh, <laughs> no, no. I mean, that, that I, I just bought a kind of acid techno record on Bandcamp. Um, well, but, I think um, these guys are into a lot of that too, so <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah, dude, so, I mean, yeah, I really like that pick scrape sound, and I think that's part of the percussion. Oh, yeah, the it pick is. pick scrape adds some of the intensity that you'd get from a slow blast beat or something. Oh, yeah, uh, you just have that kind of hollow ringing um, kind of in the void from that center guitar line. Uh, yeah, and but I remember when I was a kid, I when I was younger, I all I had was an acoustic guitar, and I would write these things on it that were kind of like you know, serviceable DSBM type things uh, mm -hmm. or just gloomy black metal parts. And I would try to record them just with the mic on my old old Mac and uh, layer distortion on it on the garage band. Yeah. And it kind of sounded better than you'd think and produced some cool sounds, except it picked up the, you know, it just got really intense. The pick scrape was just there. Yeah. Right? Um... And that was an obstacle to me at the time. These guys have made it into a virtue. Yeah, yeah they, they, they made it a cornerstone of the, the style. So uh, yeah. I think your, your next sample is actually the second track on the record. Okay, so, so, uh, and then yours is the last one? Yeah. Or the... So this is, uh, yeah, this is the second track. This is from Reside Among the Unwanted and Untended. This mm -hmm. is nine minute track so this is around five minutes or it's the back end um i think as far as anything that on this record that has more of a classic depressive or sad tone or a sort of cathartic emotional vibe i'd say that this is the this is what i would gravitate towards all right let's check it out
the way these riffs are corded is really different. Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, it's so hard to tell through the production, but it's like you've got a, a gesture a couple times in that section where it's a little bit more like a conventional DSBM riff, like something by Trist or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first riff was very, could be very DSBM, yeah. Mm -hmm. But then, like, the the sort of augmented chord shapes that they seem to be using um, gives it a really different character, you know, a very different harmonic texture, which, you know, I mean, there's plenty of stuff in DSBM where we've got these kind of simple... Um, uh, simple phrases, you know, melodic phrases that are used and reused and modified as as in any metal genre. But here it's like they're taken to a very different place with the harmonic voicing, which is really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I like chords, and I like that this band pays attention to chords, and uh, it definitely has its own harmonic language, which I think is a good require As far as being a... Uh, high-tier black metal band, you want to have your own harmonic language. Yeah. So so this definitely has it. Yeah, I mean, that's a really just smart set of... I, I remember you telling me that this guy's a very simple, straightforward compositional method. Uh, yeah, so, I, I, so I'm not 100%. Again, this is half-remembered interviews from years ago, but I believe this started as kind of a one-man project. And he talked about the whole process for doing a demo tape, just being going into his notebook of riffs that he keeps, finding a few that go well together, recording some drums for 10 minutes that he thinks would work, laying it over the top, and, you know, the demo is done in two or three hours, something like that. It's this very immediate, intuitive process. It's almost arbitrary or almost improvisational in a way, but the guy just had a, a real fucking ear for the melodies and the production, I guess. Which is kind of like I'm in a coffin, right? Where it's really yeah, yeah. like he, he sits down and it all comes out. But um, but what I was going to say is I think this is a guy who thinks a lot about chords. I think yeah. he can write them. I think he writes like that because so spontaneously because he has ideas about how these chord structures work. And, you know, uh, again in that we got that very... You know, there was this classic bleak, bleak melody. It goes into this weird, tense major key lift again. Mm -hmm. More of those kinds of '90s UK kind of ideas, uh, and then dips back down into a different version of the sad melody with the mm -hmm. drums picked up. That's really cool. That's really exciting. And it's like I think he walks around thinking about chords. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, it's uh, there's a. I don't think that these guys are necessarily um, formally trained musicians, but I think they have a real intuitive understanding of how more advanced music theory works. Oh, that's kind of what I mean, is just like, oh, you know, uh, how does it sound when you put the, your fingers three spaces apart on the two strings apart, and then you add one that's like two strings up, but like two fingers, two, two spaces apart. Yeah, that's yeah. What I think of chords, you know. <laughs> oh no, yeah, yeah. But it's like they they are able to kind of put those simple gestures together in a really interesting mm -hmm. way. So I got one more sample. This is off the uh, the third uh, track on the record called "Washed Away with the Reckoning," and uh, here we're digging into melodic ideas that remind me a lot of the uh, the negative or nothing record we covered last episode, where I went insane on air, <laughs> um, and. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I think that maybe what we're hearing here, alongside the negative or nothing, as well as like a couple other kind of DSBM stuff, uh, records that I've heard this year, maybe we're seeing a realignment of some modern DSBM a little bit away from Silencer and Nocturnal Depression and stuff like that, and a little bit more towards Bethlehem and some of those kinds of ideas. So let's listen to just the opening couple minutes of this track, and I'll talk about it a little bit. Thank you. 
So there's actually a lot going on on that sample. Like, there's actually, like, several riffs that cycle through. Um, mm -hmm. And just the... Uh, boy, this is some of the, the weirdest melodic language on the record. I think this might be my favorite song because of that. Um, I mean, how would you... How do you even describe the kind of movements of the guitar there? It really reminds me of Negative or Nothing because of the strange kind of grayness, the, the very abstract, mm -hmm. angular quality of the melodies. You know, which is interesting because you've got this incredibly warm guitar texture, but these kind of foreboding and like cutting sort of melodic ideas, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You know, we don't talk about them a lot on this show because we both agree they're overrated, but I think the thing that this guitar sounds the most like consistently through here, maybe, especially on parts like that, is uh, My Bloody Valentine. Oh, yeah, yeah, not, definitely. Not in the way that people imitate them, but in the way they actually sounded, particularly on Isn't Anything, before Loveless. Mm -hmm. uh, Loveless has this kind of, like, grunge and Britpop quality to it, almost. But um, Isn't Anything is, this is just, they linger more on those very strange, especially that riff that opened this sample, that weird kind of sliding, twisting yeah. riff. There are all sorts of slides and bends throughout this. Things that sound like they're synths, but are probably guitars. Yeah, it's that it, it's sound, that, it's funny since you've been bringing up the uh, the uh, the actual kind of shoegaze stuff because you know now shoegaze is like taken for granted as like a post black metal thing, but these guys actually seem to listen to it because there's yeah there's a lot of early My Bloody Valentine and there's a little bit of like. Uh, Suvlaki era slow dive on this also. Yeah, you know I've harped on this forever, but like, it's, yeah, the people who make Post Black generally don't listen to Shoegaze. I think they have an idea about how it sounds that maybe it comes from hearing Loveless or something. But yeah. um, nobody ever tried to imitate the chords, which were the most important parts of Shoegaze for both My Bloody Valentine and Slow Dive. Uh, yeah. This guy thought about that. Yeah. You know, if if anyone in black metal has actually listened to the chords in those bands really carefully, it was probably Roman Senko. And he made yeah. music that didn't sound anything like it superficially. Right? Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, no, there's yeah. a... I mean, that's probably... I guess that's the most unique thing about Carved Cross compared to their contemporaries is the... That sort of complex harmonic language hidden within what just appear to be these very, like, straightforward, brackish tape dsbm songs um yeah yeah the more i listen to it the more i like this I'm yeah like, there's like, a real like, richness you know, we talk about it yeah no i, I definitely think... thoroughly approve of it yeah definitely well what's interesting is uh, uh carved cross is an interesting band to pull back the camera a little bit because if you asked me what uh what my favorite carved cross release is like i don't fucking know i i pull up a tape when i want to listen to carved cross and Mm -hmm. there's all these little inflections on the sound, but it's not a band about, you know, a, a certain song. Nobody has a favorite Carved Cross song. You know, it's uh, it's mm -hmm. really, it's thoroughly a mood piece. Um, and you kind of buy into the mood and the atmosphere of it, or you don't. Because uh, obviously this is not, there's no hooks in this music. You're just kind of submerging yourself into this kind of viscous fluid, you know, and uh, seeing if you enjoy the temperature or not. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I don't think there are hooks, but there are definitely, like, discernible good parts. And I think that sets it apart, too. Or, like, discernible, like... You can point to different parts of it and say this part is doing this thing and this part is doing that thing and they interact yeah. to create this this sequenced effect or whatever, and I think that is uh, that's a sign that it's good. Yeah. It's so, a, uh, yeah, no, I think it's a good record and it'll definitely be added into the uh, the pile of Carved Cross releases that I listen to when I want to listen to Carved Cross, which is a uh, a distinct mood. But I'm glad they're there to fulfill it. <laughs> nice. So, uh, all right. So that was Carved Cross, and we'll take a quick break and come back with a, something a little bit different. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, this is Taylor from Crushing the Scepter, and you're listening to Two Terminus Podcast. All right, so uh, we're back, and on a very different note, we have Trash with Forbidden Rights, and this is a uh, this is a weird record. I mean, what would you what would you say up top about this one? This is like, well, the cover is bizarre, first of all. It's got some weird kind of, it's got some anthropological photo of some sort of tribal ritual somewhere. And uh, a horribly photoshopped trash can logo over it. Yeah. Um, It's, uh, and it looks, if not maybe for the Photoshop quality of that, it looks like the kind of record... I would find digging through record bins at a record store where I had little hope of finding anything. Yeah. And then I'd see something that looked like this and I'd think, this is either just like awful alt rock, like didn't make it alt rock from the early 90s or like, you know, sort of like alt metal or it's disgusting, bizarre stench core. (laughs) And you've got a lot to say about that one. Yeah. Yeah, and you take it home, and you're like, I have I have a great instinct. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, this is, I, I think this, I was not sure what to make of this when I heard that the band was called Trash, and I saw the cover, uh, and I was very pleasantly surprised. So... Tell me about this band that you know better than I do. Yeah, so this is um, these are a couple of guys that I know. Uh, I've uh, I've played uh, shows with some of their other bands in the past, and uh, we just recently reconnected. Uh, I've been out of the local scene for a while, but now that shows are starting again, uh, he said, you know, we we actually met up at the place where my band practices, as well as uh, one of his other ones. And we were just hanging out. He's like, "Oh yeah, so I got the uh, a new project out with my buddy. You know him, and uh, yeah, you want to check it out?" Uh, I was telling him about the podcast. I'd be like, "Yeah, definitely." And of course, you know, I say that it's like, "Well, this might fucking suck," you know. But I listened to it mm-hmm. on the drive home, and I was like, "Oh man, this is really weird and interesting." And something I'm probably going to want to talk about is these are young kids. I think the members are like 21 and 22. So they're from kind of a different metal generation. And I think that that might have something to do with the kind of weirdness of this record. So uh, up front, this is basically a a very bizarre sort of old school thrash record. We're talking early 80s thrash mixed with some punk and crossover uh, as well as some traditional Doom stuff from the late 70s and early 80s, all wrapped in this kind of, like, bleary, raw aesthetic of, like, mm-hmm. old Sodom or something like that. Yeah, bleary is right. It does sound profoundly world-weary. Yeah, it's uh, it's yeah. very strange music, and I'm interested in... You know, uh, these guys are younger than us. They're coming from this different generation. They grew up with different music. You know, when I talk to them, we're usually talking about death or black metal or grind. Um, But these kids are really into old school thrash as well. And now I'm really curious as to what they're listening to in that field and what they're picking up on it. Because while this is clearly attributable to early 80s thrash, it sounds nothing like it. You know? (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so do we want to go to explain that by going to your sample? Yeah, sure. So uh, here's just a... We'll listen to the back half of a a song that's later on the record. Uh, This is a track called Depth of Creation. And uh, I think this should be fairly representative of what most of the record sounds like. And uh, whatever you're expecting, it's not this. So let's try that out. (laughs) All right.
So, what the fuck is going on here? It's got like a uh, almost right, like yo, I'm I'm out. I gotta go loot a CVS, man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> definitely, man. It is. Uh, it's it's good music for 2020. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, um, so so it's got almost a kind of Hellhammer quality. It sounds mm-hmm. a little bit like the earliest stuff by Death. Maybe even as far back as the demos when they were Mantis. But mm-hmm. it's it's really extreme in a way, but it's not even as fast as Possessed. And then you've got that weird Megadeth stop start riff in there, like. But the, you or like the thing that, that I heard as a Pantera riff. Yeah, the da 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 da. Yeah. Oh, I loved that. That was oh, so no, it's gratuitous. Gr- it's it's and, great yeah. and so absurd. Yeah. Um, but you've got a reference point uh, for this band that you think is kind of the core of this, right? Yeah, so, I mean, could be they've converged on this sound by accident. I think what's going on, though, is, like, all you've just thrown out a range of really cool, interesting reference points that all kind of cluster in a certain mm-hmm. way, right? Um, and I think what they're all clustering around, kind of the hidden center, is this concept of late 80s stenchcore. Mostly mm-hmm. from the UK. The American band Nausea was kind of like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, basically bands that come out of the Amoebix strain of crust and sort of um, maybe throw some of the grinding quality. Some of the grindcore gets invented basically by these bands, kind of. Yeah. Uh, Nap- Napalm Death comes out of this milieu. Uh, and it's often either really fast or really slow or both. Um, mm-hmm. And... It has this kind of putrid, spiteful mood. It's kind yeah. of simultaneously wretched and scornful. Hate from the gutter. Um, and this sort of decrepit medieval imagery. It's one of my favorite subgenres. And mm-hmm. uh, in a way, I think what you sound like, with all the reference points you've thrown out, I think you basically sound like a metalhead trying to explain to another metalhead in 1991 what this music sounds like. <laughs> Probably, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? It's like, no, yeah, sounds I get like it. it sounds a lot like, you, you know, you point out the thrashes like kill them all stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, the the people that really develop, in some sense, Metallica is really important to the music I like, just not yeah. metal. Like the people. So let's let's uh, give an example of this. Uh, I, I'm just want to pull. Yeah, this is Deviated Instinct, House of Cards from Rock and Roll Conformity, 1988. All right, let's check uh-huh. this out. Man, that is weird. What 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 is that like almost glam riff at the end, you know? <laughs> like yeah, it's like Slayer. I mean, I think they're going to whip it around into a blast. Uh, yeah, it's bizarre, isn't it? Yeah. But, but you, I, can I, hear, I, you can hear that specific kind of mid-tempo groove, right? Yeah, definitely. Which is kind of what this record hovers around a lot. This sort of like extended rock music, if that term makes sense, you know? Kind of, yeah. Too slow to be a mid-tempo thrash thing. You know, it's like... It is objectively mid-tempo thrash riffs, but they have a very different effect than like a boring thrash riff. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, let's uh, uh, let's get to your sample so we can kind of explore mm-hmm. that a little bit more and kind of what you're hearing yes. on this. So this is more stenchy qualities. Um, uh, another thing that's important with uh, this genre is the vocals. Uh, you've just heard some of them. Uh, you could describe them as puke vocals. Oh yeah, the kind vo- of like they have. The vocals on this record do stand out a lot. They're, they're kind of all over the place in the best way. Like Deviated Instinct, they trade between sort of primitive gutturals and puke screeches and shit. We, we were both loving how much the guy was just screaming, ah, on the Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and also, uh, also and, uh, you'll, we'll get some uh, very surprisingly well-delivered clean vocals in a lot of places. 
Yeah, true. So um, this starts, you know, this leads with a weird musical sam uh, sample that might be like Master Musicians of Jujuka or something that they mm -hmm. actually bring in again at the end of the track as a guitar idea, which is really class. But what you should listen to up front on the sample from Resurrection 5 is lots of attention to the lyrics and the uh, vocal timing. Which is oh, definitely. All right, let's give it a shot. How does it work? Like, this should be bad, right? It's just elemental body music, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know what it is? It's, it's Krusty's breaking rules metalheads make for themselves. Yeah. Like, metalheads think, okay, we've done that thrashing riff. Now we need to, uh, now we need to change it up with a sick guitar solo. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, like... Now we need some big heavy metal lead hook. Yeah, the way they develop this song is they just keep playing slightly different thrash riffs. Yeah, um, just and like too slow. So they mm -hmm. that's something that's this uh, this whole record operates at this really weird no man's land of tempo. You know, I it's love sort of, that, yeah. it's like seek and destroy minus fifteen BPM. You know, yes, there it is. Seek and destroy minus fifteen BPM, and it gives it a. It's kind of slowed down, but in a way that gives it a bulldozer-like momentum. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, like, it's almost too slow to mosh to, you know? It's, uh... No, no, it's not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just... Uh, I once saw a, um, I saw a dreadlocked guy at a Deviated Instinct show just doing cartwheel spin kicks for the entire set. Um... <laughs> mm. uh, but yeah, you pointed out, so, actually, there's a lot of, like, interesting, cool lyrical stuff on here, which I was surprised by, because it's very audible in the vocals. Yeah, it's very, like, um, 40K from the chaos perspective or something, I don't know. Yeah. We're going to break down the walls between the gods and pitiful men, power belongs to us all, tired and dead, shouting and something... Dance in ecstasy and see what we've done. The change up there is so effective. Oh yeah, that was that was a great little uh, guitar switch, switch that happens. Switch there. to the two step and the screech. Uh, use something for the pain and be reborn, and then resurrection. And then you echo that twice. Oh yeah, it's like it's it's got a real classic quality to it. I mean, these guys it are. Does. And the, the the double echo on that <laughs> resurrection. Well, yeah. that comes from the most famous stench band that all our listeners know, which is Bolt Thrower. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, World Eater. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you're kind of, I, I, I'm really interested to talk to these guys and see if they were listening to the same kind of stuff you're talking about or whether it is parallel evolution. Um, just because I, I'm sure they're familiar with this stuff, but you know, we don't really talk about a lot of early kind of mm -hmm. crust or anything like that, just because mm -hmm. we talk about our common interests. Um, what's also really interesting is the, uh, the sample at the beginning and how that's a consistent thing throughout the record are these little snippets of ambient stuff, weird samples that are kind of communicating this 
story, I think, in a way, this sort of, like, atavistic return to barbarism or something like that. Definitely some return to barbarism shit, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, definitely some intense, just misanthropic hatred of contemporary society. Uh, reminds me of rudimentary peony at times. Yeah, but yeah. The kind of, but without the kind of, like self-righteous you know rudimentary yeah, yeah. has this attitude of aggrieved weakness and self-righteousness yeah this yeah. is not like that at all this is much more like um just mute you know the end of the dark night when the mutants take over yeah um, yeah yeah can i before we move on can i just play my can i play one more deviated instinct sample oh, please just fine go up. for it oh all right cool it's just i think this closely parallels the resurrection thing yeah and this is from 1987 uh on welcome to the orgy so this is before bolt thrower starts doing these kinds of hooks mm -hmm. and starts before 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 uh in battle there's no law all right, all right cool so this is off uh welcome to the orgy the track is Disciples of the Storm. All right, let's try it. Let's go to your sample now, or wherever you want to go. Oh, okay. I wasn't done with the sample, but all right. <laughs> oh, oh shit. Oh, did I keep it going longer? Uh, yeah. Morning. Oh, I kept I kept the sample going longer. Yeah, yeah. No, no but I, I definitely hear it because I mean that's what that like uh, you know that uh, held guitar stuff that would become crucial to stuff like War Master and the Fourth Crusade and <laughs> stuff like that. I mean that's what that's what both thrower hooks are. Just a slowed down version of that. Um, so here's a, here's a sample of what's probably my favorite track on the album. Um, so one thing we haven't heard so far is there's a lot of kind of trad doom across this record, mm -hmm. but this song in particular is basically a crowbar song, but brought back into the eighties in a way. Uh, so this is a track called eyes of solitude. So let's try this one out.
that's just that's fucking great. Like uh, it's it, it's one of those things where it's like if it if it was done by guys who were like more confident or like you know we're just kind of like kicking that one off but they it's like they realize the gravity of this song at its place like at the end of the album and it's like they're a little nervous to go through with it because they know it's this big departure and that's what makes it land so hard yeah you can hear that the um uh there's also just like I mean, one thing that makes bands that attempt things like that so bad most of the time, at least to me, is the stoner influences. Yeah, there's none of that here. There's, like, none of that. Um, This is just... People talk about the sense of paranoid misery on the first St. Vitus record. Yeah. This is just that without any of the wide leg pants shit. Um, (laughs) It's... It's like, um... Or the flare jeans. Um, It's... And there's a since you know I mean for lack of a better word he just he's clearly feeling it yeah and I, I, I love how they it, just you were talking about the quaver in his voice yeah there's like especially at the very beginning it's like because I've never heard this guy sing clean before I've heard him do vocals before I didn't realize he did any clean stuff so you've got that quality of like a guy who's kind of uncertain but then once he gets into the groove of it he gets stronger as it continues. Which is the sort of thing that would be edited out of any other album, you know? It's like, no, the, the, the unsteadiness and the way it kind of shapes itself over the course of that passage mm-hmm. is what makes it so interesting, even when it's basically just the same riff over and over again. It's the same musical part, you know, but the fluctuations give it character. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like an actual emotional episode. It sounds like he was feeling it. Um it sounds like those eyes do keep him awake when he's lying at night. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and like, uh, yeah, you can hear him just putting... I mean, one thing I love about this music, and one thing that connects it to Stench as well, but also, like, Good Doom, is they're putting body into it. Yeah, he's there's a jam. real weight. They're hitting the guitars. He's belting. He's not doing some affected Ozzy nasal thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, uh, you know, he's singing kind of from the chest, right? Um, yeah. And he's got that natural sort of gravel in his voice from that. Yeah, I think that's that's very good and powerful, and it's a it makes sense to include here. Definitely. Um, and then you've also got kind of a weird doom sample too. Yeah. So in some sense, I think where this band, I guess, clusters around is on the one hand this kind of like wretched stenchcore thing, and on the other hand, this sort of aspect of kind of uh, doom that's maybe connected to stench via eighties goth. Kind of. And just the fact that, like, Amoebics was into Sabbath and all that. Yeah. You know, their general tempo. Tempo and mood ideas. Uh, But, like, the sound, as weird as this band is, basically, and as varied as the sounds are, the songs are, they basically all kind of make sense together. Yeah, they do. It's a nice spectrum between the sort of the threat. If anything feels most out of place, it's probably Ceremonial Sacrifice. Yeah. Just a bit more like a Toxic Holocaust song or something. Yeah, um, I can hear that. Not necessarily a bad one. I, I like the I like Toxic Holocaust up to a certain point. It's good party music. But mm-hmm. um anyway, Wandering in Purgatory. Uh I think I accidentally sampled fucking three minutes of it. Yeah, I, that seemed like a little much. <laughs> let's not play it that long. Let's just play the beginning of it. Um let's okay, start, sure. yeah. Or it's beginning of my sample. So this is in the middle of the song. Um, what I'll say at the beginning is just, this is the first kind of sabbath shit on the record. Yeah. And when I first heard the riff, I hated it. I was like, this is a bad riff and probably a literal quote of Sabbath or Wizard. Or Electric Wizard. <laughs> and then when I played it, after I, I gave it some time, I was like, oh, this is really good. Yeah. Um, All right. So, Let's yeah. try it out. Come on, 
No, I actually, I, I had that same reflexive thing <laughs> that you did when I first heard that. I was like, oof, that's ugly. That, uh, that kind of stoned out Sabbath riff. But you're right. Yeah. Once you wrap it into the context of everything else, it does actually work. Yeah, they just like, I mean, even when you, even listening back over it, you're like, oh, this is a pretty good version of that bad riff. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, even in the sort of middle of the song where it just sort of bellies out and goes full stoner. Yeah, yeah. It's a very, very the, like chaos kind of thing that happens there. The drummers laying on the cymbals pretty hard, and there are nice variations in the riff, and they have the sense of groove that they have everywhere else is still there. But yeah, what really justifies it, man, those fucking... I mean, did Danzig guest on this? <laughs> it's not entirely impossible, you know? I think if you'd offered to pay a strip club bill... I was probably, about to say, he, he does need the work now, uh, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, sounds like Danzig there, and has the sort of, um... You know... It sounds like Danzig in the context of the people who listen to Danzig... <laughs> that is, it has it has all the gritty working class bleakness of a place where danzig is played all the time <laughs> yeah. oh that's 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 a good way to, that's a good way to describe this music as a whole you know a working mm -hmm. class bleakness which uh mm -hmm. is definitely something we experience out here so oh, oh yeah, yeah for sure in that case trash really good first album definitely uh definitely want to hear how these ideas evolve on future stuff. I hope they keep this one going because I think they've got the seeds of something really great here. Um, Definitely see if you can get Glenn to come back for a few more tracks. <laughs> Definitely. So, uh, since we're just doing, uh, kind of talking a lot about old 80s stuff uh, for an interlude, I decide uh, let's just pull up a, a kind of forgotten uh, French speed metal band who I really enjoy uh, called ADX. Uh, this is from back in 85 off their uh, Execution album, and this is just the opening track, and uh, how the fuck do you pronounce that? Is it a Dice du Crime? Or... Uh, I, I don't... I, wait, sorry, am I... Uh, <coughs> got, a, got a cough from um, uh, fucking up my crust vocals. Um, <laughs> Dace, uh, yeah, Dace du Crime, I have no idea, but there's... Yeah, Dais, yeah, Du Crime. Well, anyway, this is just sure. real fast, high-flying speed metal shit, so uh, we'll give this a listen, and then uh, we'll be back with the back half of our episode. <laughs>
All right, and with some uh, French speed metal winding down, uh, let us rejoin our friends over in Southeast Asia. Uh, first up for this block, we have Vong with A Wander in Liminality. And uh, like you said up front, this is a uh, this is a buddy of the guys from Elcrost, and I believe he actually he's a, a live player for Elcrost also. I think he might be their live bassist. I think they might play as his live band as well. Yeah, it, it might just be a, a back and forth thing. Yeah, small scene, you know, everybody's got to wear multiple hats. So, I f I think I really like this record a lot. Like, uh, I was not expecting to up front, but there's a lot of depth to it. I think. Yeah. No. I mean, I I agree. This is a. Uh, it's so. What this is, we might as well give it away for people. This is, if if this is the only black metal band in Han Hanoi, Vietnam, well, you know it's got to be a Dark Throne worship band. Yeah. Uh, because that's kind of where, I think my sort of, here, my, my historical law, which throwing out for whatever it's worth is, at this point, whenever any sort of any national scene starts to absorb black metal, you're always going to get some Dark Throne worship bands at the beginning. But, um, and so we grew up in really dark days for that, right? Yeah. You could say in the early, in the, oh, in the OOs, I don't know, what are people calling those? The aughts? I just um, call them the 2000s. I mean, that sounds the most yeah, elegant in, to me. We're still in the 2000s, but I know what you mean. Yeah, Fuck the off. 2000s. <laughs> in, no, I know what you mean. Yeah, okay. So in the 2000s, uh, there were all these horrible bands that you could call Burr's Throne mm -hmm. that were just kind of like generic bits of Transylvanian hunger and Burzum. Uh, and then in the in the teens, uh, there were all these horrible sort of crusty hat, crusty trucker hat, dark throne worship bands, right? Yeah. Which were, which were like, uh, more drawn from like, uh, you know, a blaze in the northern sky and certain parts of under a funeral moon. Uh, and all of these bands drew on all the least interesting characteristics of dark throne. Yeah. Right. So yeah. well, this is this is a case where it's this is a Burr's Throne band. I actually think that the the Burzum influence is the predominant one on this one. Um, it definitely gets more so as the record goes on. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, but what this guy seems to be picking up on are the the challenging and interesting parts of early Burzum and Dark Throne, which make them special. Mm -hmm. Rather yes. than he's not yes. just recreating an aesthetic. He actually knows, one, how that music was structured, and two, how does he make it his own? And I think the ways that he makes it his own are really interesting and cool. Yes. Um, so so this is, you know, like on Metal Archives, it calls it like raw black metal. And it's got kind of like a, a scratchy, high-pitched production, but mm -hmm. I mean, I think this is a, it's also called a demo. I think this is just a, a totally serviceable full length. You know, I think this is a record that I will listen to again because there's very interesting ideas on it. Um, so we should probably just... I would I would class it with... Uh, yeah, raw black metal? No, it's just black metal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just... I mean, it's a little underproduced. I don't think it has to live in the raw black metal ghetto. Uh, and with that, I would class it alongside um, uh, Panzer War. Uh, yeah, that's fair. You know, something because... that sort of has a one-man thing, kind of digitally produced, uh, shows extreme attention to the things that made Second Wave Norse Black Metal good, and does not at all sound like the other things that are getting sold a lot, that are getting marketed alongside it. Yeah. You know? um, so let's jump into your first so, sample yeah. and see what we're looking at. Yeah, so uh, this one is something like Le Chi Vien. Um, this is the first major long song on the record. Uh, this is a seven minute song. And so at the end of this song, the back, this is a new project by one guy. And by the back end of the song, he's still getting to some of his best ideas. So this is around the five minute mark. All right, let's check it out.
Yeah. So, I mean, that's got, that's definitely got that explosive slowdown stuff that, uh, Dark Throne would do. But that's also, I mean, Dark Throne would do it, but that element has been given very outsized importance in a lot of these modern Dark Throne clone bands. Mm hmm. This, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, th well, this gets the, uh, what a lot of those don't get is the explosive part. They don't get the yeah, that's true. part. When the double bass kicks in here, um, it sounds fast and exciting. Yeah. And, and... the chord, yeah. Oh, go ahead. The chords just dance over it. So, uh, I, I had a couple things I wanted to say about just the, the riff writing here, and mm. then... Just like thinking about the the blocky power chord main riff, you could st start. We both really liked that trill riff, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. then the, the the main riff comes of the song sort of comes back with the with the double bass part, um, and it's very under a funeral moon. But what sets it apart from all these crappy Dark Throne worship bands is a guitar tone. So the bands that imitate the Under a Funeral Moon and Blaze in the Northern Sky often like isolate the punkiest parts of it or the hellhammeriest mm -hmm. parts and make this big bludgeoning beefy guitar tone, right? Yeah. Uh, this is hollow, clanging, and heavy. There's okay? a real heaviness to this. Just. I think it's just through the way he's playing guitar. He's really swinging into those uh, mm. those tempo yes. drops and stuff like that. So even though it's very kind of thin production, it still it feels heavy in the way that cool second wave black metal felt heavy. And it's effectively scooped. It's it's not. There are lows. There just aren't a lot of mids in it. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's true. It's just not a very bass heavy has, production as a whole. Yeah, it's it's like, uh, but yes, also the way he plays, and that's one of the things that make Dark Throne so good is what good players they are together. Yeah. Uh, but um, so okay, so the tone distills a lot of what's good about Dark Throne and the second wave in general, and the choice of chords. So again, uh, all these sort of um, you know, the crusty Dark Throne bands are like the raw, rockin' Dark Throne black metal bands. Uh, in terms of their choice of intervals and scales they turn it back into slayer or if you're lucky celtic frost yeah which means it's kinds of like or or sometimes they just turn it into rock music yeah exactly yeah. so the worst ones and, but in terms of the note in terms of the note choice that means like the thing that we've started to realize is sort of like the standard extreme metal guitar vocabulary which is from rain and blood right mm -hmm. just these sort of slinky eastern minor scale with a lot of tritones and passing tones in it right yeah um and this guy gets the things that are really essential to Dark Throne, which is, A, the bit of folk melody that sort of was lurking behind their riffs, mm -hmm. right? So, like, that last kind of Burzumi breakdown could also be Isengard, right? Um, yeah, that's true. And then just punishing chromaticism breaking into it. That comes from the fact that they were a death metal band. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and there's a, there's you know, a lot the, of that sort of melodic technique employed on this record. Like, this guy does some really vicious early death metal kind of chromatic things um, that a lot of people yeah. try to do, but it's very hard to do right, and this guy pretty much always pulls it off. Yeah, all, and, you know, he because there's such active playing here, he'll throw them in as little sort of passing tones or squiggles in the main riffs, little bends and embellishments. And instead of just being extras that make it a little more than a stock riff, they're really important to the shape of the riff. Yeah. Um, yeah, also the drums are cool, but we could talk about those later. Let's, what else, <laughs> anything else, you got anything else about this part, or you want to move on? Uh, not for that one, but I think my next sample adjoins with that pretty well, because this is mm -hmm. just like, like I, I almost punched one of my cats in the living room when I heard this part. Uh, <laughs> cause, so this is off uh, At Dao. Uh, year of the Rooster, and uh, apologies to Vong for our mangling Vietnamese pronunciation. I can pr I can pronounce some Thai stuff, but Vietnamese is totally beyond me. Um, so this is a huge Burr's Throne riff, and mm -hmm. this just might be one of the the heaviest fucking drops I've ever heard in this kind of style of black metal. So uh, this is pretty right. early on in the track. Let's just check this out.
added something for both of us. Oh, yeah. Oh, fuck yeah, dude. Like, and a very small thing he's doing on that giant breakdown riff, because everyone forgets, mm-hmm. like, early second wave black metal is littered with breakdowns. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's a yeah. thing that Most, happened. Yeah, and they were really good. And then everybody... Yeah, that's one of those do as I do, not as I say things. Yeah, They talk yeah. about how much they hate hardcore because they're trying to make a point about happy, fun, goofy guy sort of death metal, right? Yeah, yeah. But then yeah. they access the same stuff. And what's exactly. cool specifically about that riff, and it's a subtle thing that Dark Throne did a lot, <clears throat> is when he's playing this, that horrible sawing riff, mm-hmm. he's, he's swinging out the guitar timing... So what's on the uh, what's on the beat is the slide and he hits the new chord an eighth note after the slide, which just gives mm. it this lurching, brutal yeah. fucking quality. So just swinging da, it really da, 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 da. Yeah, you see, it's like it's 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 hitting on the you know, on the upbeat after the one. And uh, it's a great technique. Dark Throne did that constantly. I mean that's uh, in the shadow of the horns. That little stagger, da da dun 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 dun. That's the same fucking technique. And yeah, uh, yeah, it's like just really intense swinging or syncopation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's really important when you want to make something like this land. And but the other thing I want to point out are the slide riffs, which I mm-hmm. think are the heart of. Vong's personal sound. Like, obviously, there's a ton of Burzum Dark Throne, but he's making it his own, and I think one of the big ingredients is the constant slide riffs. Almost all the so riffs on the track... describe what you mean for those people. I, I love slides, but I almost didn't even pick up a, as much on that as you did, probably because it's such an integral part of Dark Throne and early Burzum. I didn't even think about it. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Um, yeah, so... The, the slide thing is, like, obviously when you're playing guitar, especially you're playing fast metal guitar, you're sliding because that's a an easier way to play very fast, continuous riffs than by releasing and refretting. But there are ways to make that slide sound an important part of the riff. And mm-hmm. that's something that's continuously happening across this whole record. He wants these dramatic slides, these kind of, like, nauseating bends into and out of notes, uh, which is a very kind of like, uh, as we always say, a morbid angel thing to do. These sort of adornments that are all coming from uh, kind of like a blues vocabulary, really, just applied to these really nasty chromatic things, uh, which gives it a radically different feel. You know, if these riffs were just played on the beat in a very standard way, they wouldn't be nearly as interesting as they are with, like you said, these little adornments and embellishments that he's putting on, which completely transform what would have been probably kind of like stock Dark Throne riffs in a lot of places. I don't think they would have been. You don't think so? I think th- I think the fundamental riffing here is so good. That's what That's the point I was trying to make, is that like... Sometimes we say that about a band, like, oh, we can recognize, oh, here's the Senor Valand riff, okay, and they changed the chord on the end of it. At least yeah. they didn't, you know, or like, here's this very basic, uh, you know, um, you know, very, I, I don't know, yeah, very basic riff of any style that gets ripped off a lot right now. And you, there's something is done to make it a good version of that basic form. But mm-hmm. I, I think he just has... Instead of imitating Dark Throne and Burzum riff forms and adjusting them to make them his... He knows how to make Instead them. of working with stock ideas, I think he hears melodies in the same way. Mm-hmm. So you think it's a, it's a much more natural process, really? Exactly. Yeah, it's more natural. It's more like he has full ideas that just work in... It's much more like he's in dialogue with them than using them as toolkit, as parts in a kit. Does that make sense? No, I get that. This does honestly yeah. sound much more authentically old school than that's, that's most what I mean. black metal does. He he understands. He's not fixated on what they did. He understands how they did it. Yeah, um, I get that. And and he has an ear for how they write melodies and just you know. Uh, when it when the when, uh, like I was saying like when that black when it the you know double bass comes in again and it rips I love mm-hmm. that part and that has this sort of stri- haunting very dissonant but also kind of minor scale folky sounding melody or just Nordic sounding this band doesn't really sound Nordic 
but it uses a lot of the similar melodic ideas that bands like Dark Throne or Burzum no, use, yeah. where it's just like... Well, there's... um, <clears throat> I think that's part of this sort of greater Asiatic black metal sound. Because, at least in my experience, a lot of the Asian black metal bands are starting from second wave building blocks, but they're, uh, they're actually kind of faster than a lot of other regions, I think, to start layering in these very subtle kind of folk ideas. Because um, actually what this, uh, this reminds me a lot of is a, a band that's been around for a while, but is just starting to kind of pick up some speed. Uh, it's a project called Inferno Requiem out of Taiwan. Uh, mm. who has a very similar kind of, uh, mo- more kind of extreme than this kind of mayhem meets Dark Throne thing. Um, mm. Same very kind of crackly, thin production. But, oh, uh, yeah, this guy's been, yeah, this guy's been getting some attention for sure. Yeah, and he's he's been around for probably 15 years, something like that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, the, so there's something similar going on where he's, he's incorporating, not in, like, big, gross here's a folk part, but just a subtle intrusion of those ideas into the greater melody, the bulk of which is kind of founded in second wave and then augmented from there. Well, well, they really get that. And the second wave people did that too. That's where second wave riffs yeah. come from is that they were, that was what was formed their basic riffs. And so like they get, yeah, they get this thing that was important to the second wave that other people forget, I think. And they're doing it in their own way. Definitely. Um, you have a good example of that coming up, right? Uh, yeah. This is uh, mm-hmm. this is actually off the final track on the album called uh, My Dreams of Malaria. By the way, if you haven't great seen... Great title. <clears throat> great song titles and actually really outstanding lyrics across this whole thing. I don't know if you checked any of it out, but... Uh, I didn't have a chance to check them out, but what are they like? Really kind of like beautiful, haunting, kind of very ghostly peasant stories kind of abstract mm-hmm. vietnamese peasant stories i That's think there's cool. i because I, I think that a lot of it's based off like uh, regional folk tales and i think there might be some historical stuff i have some ideas about how the at, at least aesthetically the french colonization of vietnam and you know french indochina as it was called kind of influences some of the aesthetic choices from some of these bands but uh but yeah my, my dreams of malaria Another great song. And this is where I'll get into a little bit of comparison with uh, Elcrost. And what I see is maybe this is a foundational idea of what Vietnamese black metal is. So uh, let's give this one a try real quick. So yeah, um, uh, springs pass by, still lies this husk, brittle bones now wrapped in silk. I am one with the forest, forever lost we wander, to tread on dead leaves, to flow with the cold streams, through mountains and pass among the solemn trees we roam. Fuck yeah, dude. Ugh. 
And you, you know, you gotta yeah. imagine that I raise my claw to the setting sun. Oh, dude, you know? yeah. yeah, like, and it's a lot of it's kind of ghost story stuff. And I gotta say, you know, you're imagining this guy is operating in English as a second language, and that just sounds like mm-hmm. that doesn't just sound like an English person writing lyrics. It's an actual smart English black metal guy <laughs> writing lyrics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, but back to the music. Um, definitely, again, want to draw attention to those slide riffs. You know. And uh, mm-hmm. especially way the that really aggressive sawing kind of under a funeral moon slide riff, mm-hmm. like kind of just drifts into that sort of a Havis Lisset Tar Oss kind of darker arpeggiated the part. Creepy arpeggios at the end, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And uh, but I really liked their riff right before that. That sort of uh, oh yeah, that one. big yeah. one. Yeah, no, it's uh, so I think that what I'm seeing here between this and Elcross is. Even at its most aggressive, this feels still like very dreamy music. And that was something we said about Elcross. It has this sort of like almost feminine, oniric quality to it, um, despite how intense it can get. And now I'm wondering, is that just this well, circle of music? It's got a lady on the cover. It does have a lady on the cover, although this lady looks a little meaner than the one from the All Cross covers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's wearing um, a cow skull. Sure, she has a cow skull. Yeah. Um, but yeah. maybe, uh, now I'm curious, now I want to hear some more Vietnamese black metal bands, because maybe that's w- a, at least an idea in the national sound, so to speak, is this dreamy kind of ghostly quality. Which you'll hear kind of versions of, maybe in French here and there, but this is very different. This is very rooted oh, in it's, its land. Yeah, It's parallel to the French, but different, and I think more consistent with a certain kind of harshness. I mean, yeah. like, at least here, I mean, well, I mean, the dream, let's say the French have plenty of aggressive stuff, but the dreamy kind of French black metal kind of concentrates around these indulgent melodies. They right. tend to be more sentimental. Sure. This is this grandiose is, sentimental. This is dreamy, but it's also kind of cruel and cold. Yes, exactly. Yeah, there's the dreamy. It's this is yeah, peasant ghost story is good. Another way of expressing it might be um, feminine. Might be one way. I see what you mean. Um, maybe I mean maybe more so with Alcross stuff. Uh, but um, but I can hear what you mean. Mm-hmm. Like the yeah the dark feminine or whatever yeah but also, el- you could express it elementally as this is maybe the first time I've heard black metal that's really geared towards aquatic ideas huh that's interesting um, like you I'm just looking at the cover here and the uh, la- the cow skull lady who maybe is some sort of goddess or maybe just is the creation of an artist is surrounded by fish and python and a python and a python's devouring fish. Mm -hmm. Uh, or sort of devouring their own tails, never mind. But um, it has something to do with the territory, right? Vietnam Vietnam is a watery land. Yeah. It's a coastal country with uh, super rainy seasons. Yeah, and some of the L-Cross dudes, the guys from the scene and I, we follow each other on Instagram, they post a lot of pictures of their fish, which is not something other... I mean, I know that people in the West have pet fish, but it's not like... Odds wise, you're unlikely to see someone posting a picture of their pet fighting fish or something yeah. on Instagram. And well, it is it is historically a, a fisherman's nation, so yeah. So water, you know, water, uh, forests, uh, flat lands, although hills and that those lyrics. Uh, it's there's some different nature different nature tropes that are maybe unfamiliar to us are being activated here yeah well, there's there's probably all sorts of there's probably all sorts of you know just a kind of native vietnamese mythos and folk tales that we probably can't even perceive because we don't have the the yeah. background oh, knowledge also, it's called a wander in liminality and that relates to this idea it's like borderline borderline it's sort of it exists at the in the, in the dusk Right. Or yeah, I mean, in, kind of the, the edges of the reality, where exactly, where kind of the, yeah, where the kind ghost. of the the real world and the ghost world meet. You know, exactly, exactly. Yes, and I think it very much captures that, and so it has the, it has the, the fearsome quality, but there's also these like, places to explore, or places that draw you in, and elude you a bit. Uh, 
it's maybe a, a dangerous place, but it's not aggressive to you. There's just things that could happen if you explore these spaces. Yeah, it's a little bit like cool wizard music. Yeah, it's you got know, a cool wizard quality. Yeah. Yeah, it's Vietnamese cool wizard. You're wandering in the you can you you can see ghosts, right? Yeah. And you're 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 wandering in the parts of the town where the ghosts are more frequent. Where they like to congregate, know, uh, you know. Yeah, and this is the power that can threaten you. Maybe it's a power you can command in a scary way. Maybe it's also just some place you go for knowledge or escape. Oh, actually, well, I mean, honestly, the, actually, the uh, the first paragraph of lyrics on this record off uh, a wandering liminality it goes, and I wade through dusk and swamps, knees deep in red joss paper, my back slouches, bearing this urn of my own ashes. And for those who don't know, joss paper is. Uh, sort of a, a sacrificial paper that's burned to uh, send money or to send objects into the afterlife for your ancestors, oh, cool. things like that. So, I mean, just the imagery of that wandering through a swamp filled brimming with this Joss paper. So, I mean, I guess that is, that is him entering the ghost world, isn't he? Dude, like white fingers, the lotus pierced the surface, hidden in the fog there, chanting's heard, and somewhere beneath the ripples, a snake sheds its tears, its cries muffled. That's so good. Dude, these lyrics are Dude, awesome. Dude, it keeps, I mean, this, this is exactly both of the things. Okay, here's the elemental feminine thing. To drown in a sea of wisdom, with my youth, gladly I shall trade, while choking on mother's milk, and entangled in long-lost lullaby. Yeah, yeah. She, well, there's a, uh, and there was another reference to uh, kind of nursing or milk later on the album. So there, yeah, there's this whole kind of set of cultural themes here that are really interesting, especially coming to this kind of for the first time. Yeah, honestly, yeah, this has the sort of crystallization of a whole world that the early second wave fantasy Satanism had. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Mm-hmm. Okay, you got yeah, you got enough. Yeah, I guess we like this a lot. Yeah, okay, no, I, I love won't this. Say any, yeah, I guess I won't say anything about. We we got to move on, so I think I'll just say everything I need to before the sample, which is just, uh, really cool overtone on the guitar, or maybe like a chiming piano note, kind of like I want to be your dog. Mm -hmm. Some sort of very interesting drone effect here. And uh, as soon as you'll hear this, you'll know this is just Black Metal Guy Bait. <laughs> All right. And this is off of the sickest song title. The, bir the birds shall carry my bones home. Fuck yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Yeah, that is uh, that is definitely for you, isn't it? <laughs> and for me oh, also, because that's sick. <laughs> that's barbaric as fuck. Yeah, <laughs> so heavy. So uh, yeah, Vong 
a wandering liminality. This is a really good record, and uh, I'm really this looking is a forward really to hearing good more. Record. And clearly, yeah, we got to yeah. we got to just start checking out more of these Vietnamese guys. Uh, talk to L Cross again, see who else is hanging out, and because uh, I mean, this is two records that are really interesting and unique that we liked a lot. So maybe there's something in the waters over there. We'll definitely check it Hales out. Hail Vong. Hails to Vong. So we'll take a quick break and come back with our final record of the night. This is a little one gash, and you're listening to Terminus. All right, and we are back with our final record of the night, and uh, we've got War Cult with Death Him. And uh, these guys just kind of came out of nowhere to you on uh, Instagram, right? I might have, like, liked or something or something. I might have... I think I follow Cult of Belial, who put out um, something we reviewed a while ago. I think possibly the uh, Meslam Taya. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I can't remember exactly which it was. Yeah, but but anyway, um, something that something pretty recent that we covered. And uh, um, yeah, I think I just followed them or something, and the dude must have been like, hey, this is a podcast, and he sent me their shit. And uh, uh, it is... Yeah, he was a super chill dude, as far as I could tell, and uh, and yeah, what what got kept, grabbed me about this? Well, probably first of all, the really sick band picture, <laughs> um, which is them on top of what looks like a barren hill with a piece of obscure ruined military hardware, like yeah. concrete surrounding <laughs> concrete surrounding a steel form, so it looks like a hammer. In one of these pictures, there's lightning going off behind them that I think is real. That's pretty uh, sick. <laughs> yeah, they. I think they ran up there as a storm was approaching. And there are different tiers of war metal bands, right? So there's, like, your shit tier is, like, hardcore dude in a revenge shirt, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're, like, you're, like, middle tier is, like, people imitating Ross Bay. And for me, at least, top tier is knee-high boots and jodhpurs. <laughs> this is a knee this is a knee-high boots and jodhpurs war metal band. Um, and uh, they all wear spiked bracelets and shit. And yeah. they're from Indonesia. Uh, which, Mandung, which actually Indonesia. has a, uh, a pretty big kind of war metal scene of its own, or at least extremely raw, aggressive black metal scene. Yeah, so, I mean, the bands I initially grouped them with are not specifically Indonesian. because You probably know that better than me, so get that in, in a second. But uh, Impiety, right, who from yeah. that neck of the woods... Um, although this is way more stripped down than Impiety. And also a band that we referenced on our Impiety episode, which is, I think, number two of Terminus, which was uh, Surrender of Divinity, mm -hmm. which yeah. also connects to Vong a little bit. But who are these Indonesian war metal bands? Ooh, okay. Okay, you're putting me on the spot because i got to remember some of the names. Um, mm. So there, there really is a community. I used to know more about this some years back. We could come back to it. Yeah, we can come back. It'll probably pop up in my head. There was one I'm thinking of. Oh, actually, not from Indonesia, from Singapore is uh, one of mm -hmm. the bands I'm trying to think of. But those scenes trade, you know, a yeah, lot sure. with each other. They're different islands near each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's this whole kind of like Indonesian and Singaporean kind of raw and uh, war scene going on. And uh, this is interesting, though, because, I mean, this kind of gets back, because we've talked about this a few times, you know, what is war metal? Because this, I read as a pretty straightforward kind of post-Panzer Division Marduk black metal band, because it lacks some of the, uh, the kind of, like, death thrash qualities I usually associate with war metal. This is very, like, strict in the way that it operates, and it's missing some of the kind of chaos and slop like this is very organized music, kind of rigidly so. Um, so, I, but I guess that's just kind of a different read on the same thing. Yeah, well, we can get into that as we go. I know what you mean. I yeah, I think, or I could just say it now. I mean, and we can show you some examples as we go. But like, yeah, war metal is a famously nebulous term. It's useful mostly. It's useful mostly just because it's kind of cool. It is it very has, like, cool. A vibe. <laughs> um. You know, uh, as far as... It's kind of like grindcore, almost, in that there's no specific riff set. Yeah. As, what The way I think of it. And it's like, um, if it, I think so, the Ross Bay sounding stuff, which is often chaotic, low-end heavy, muddy, uh, you could put Archgoat and Beharit kind of in that group, although Archgoat 
as you've showed me, is kind of different. Um, yeah, they're kind of uh, just stomping it out. Or but a but a yeah. band something close would be like Lust or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sort of r- rumbling, chaotic, or Deifago from this neck of the. Or, Deifago's from this neck of the woods, aren't they? Um, I thought they were Filipino. Let me double check. Yeah, well, okay, uh, Southeastern Asian island chain. Uh, yeah, uh, oh, yeah, they're Filipino. Islands. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, but uh, they um, but like yeah, that whole school. I'm not a big fan of most of that. I like the foundational bands. I like Blasphemy, I like Archgoat, but not a big fan of that style. Um, there's death thrashing stuff which creeps in. So that that would include like Australia. A lot of Australian war metal, yeah, bestial war and lust, that sort of thing. Intersecting with that, so- mm-hmm. yeah, Gospel of the Horns, who I'm a big fan of, and then and then there's this stuff that is coming more directly from black metal. Yeah, sure. I and I think I guess I see this as part of the third prong of war metal. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's metal that actually, whereas a lot of the bestial stuff just really sounds like unholy goat rape. Yeah, this is this sounds very harsh. Yeah, this does sound very martial, co- crisp, martial, cold, inhuman, and has the sort of modern twentieth century or modern warfare sound that war metal is supposed to have. Um, That's true. So let's uh, yeah, well, so let's uh, just jump in yeah. with a sample. Let's uh, let's get the blast beats going. <laughs> so this is what this is the track that grabbed me. This is where I was like, oh, this band is good. Um, okay. We need to cover them. Um, yeah. This so this is their uh, lead single. Uh, for the record, which is Inquisition. All right, let's go. Um. Black metal guy, a, uh, a a glorious open major key phrase emerging out of a morass of endless blast beats and vicious uh, sort of chromatic riffing. What band is that? Ah, uh, could it be Knit in Division One Eighty Seven? It always is. All the best bands sound like Knit in Division. <laughs> But that's actually pretty distinct there, because that's literally the technique that they use on their songs. Oh, that um, is glorious. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Oh, and another thing that I will uh, I'll get to a little bit later, but I guess I mean that actually makes a good point is it's kind of the the foundation of this music is Panzer Division Marduk, but there's a shit Absolutely. ton there's a shit ton of immortal across this record. Mm-hmm, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those specific chords could be immortal chords too. Those are yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and like late immortal even, but uh, which mm-hmm. is like we always say, a band that's been like sort of forgotten in terms of influence, you know. And mm-hmm. it's it, we're just starting to hear bands kind of let that creep back in. It's like, oh well, we and, can do the. Really there's epic- a lot about immortal that's very amenable to the war metal idea, right? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, battles in the north is you could call that a war metal album in a way, you know. <laughs> Yeah, pure Holocaust. I mean, pick your era of immortal. It all sounds like war metal. Yeah, um, that's true. It's uh, so okay. So other than that, what I wanted to say about this is just, um, this is monolithic music, like maybe more so than Panzer Division. Right? Oh yeah. Um, and it's like some bands, uh, some most bands just use power chords, right? 
they just it's just ready to hand it's just a tool they pick up they take it for granted without even thinking about it this band but which is bizarre right it's like yeah. that's like the foundation of our music this band plays power chords this band passionately cares about power chords and has organized all of their music around you know four or five set series of dorian scale power chord melodies uh, yeah and the the most excite before they bring in that huge sounding immortal thing the most exciting part of this song is just that sort of staggered when it starts staggering um that halt that sort of like uh it starts like accumulating blast beats mm-hmm. staggering and it's just on one fucking chord yeah uh, and and then it releases into this glorious subtly strangely timed immortal riff but that's just two chords all that happened is that they just like added either one other string or just switched from a straight fifth power chord yeah slightly modified it it sounds fast mm-hmm. just from that um and uh so this close so you know i love these rigorous bands that care a lot about micro variations that work a lot yeah um, other things i'd flag from here is throughout this re- the song structure here applies throughout the record you just blitz through the beginning of it like first minute and 30 or two minutes and then you open it up a little more yeah you do. and the album as a whole works like that a little bit too which is kind of how panzer division marduk is organized so I understand what you mean. Yeah, both most of this album is based off of that structure. It's about a, a third, you know, like a half to two thirds, just kind of blasting aggression, and there's usually a big melodic moment that happens towards mm-hmm. the end, which um, I, I guess is something you could hold against it, but it works every time, and the songs are compact enough that it doesn't drag that process out. It stays exciting, so I think it still works pretty well. It's like a ritual thing. Yeah, it's, like, it's a system of it's, songwriting. It's, it, yeah, it's part of the monolithic quality of it. It's just yeah. like, it. yeah, so. Well, it's like Bolt, Bolt Thrower writes the same song every time, and it's perfect every time, so. I mean. <laughs> True. True. Um, so, yeah, so I got a sample uh, off uh, Panzer Six, and this is where I'll get into what I think kind of distinguishes these guys from their contemporaries. Uh, one of them, as we've already seen, is those big melodic touches, which I think is something that more kind of war-style metal bands should be doing, you know, mm-hmm. just to provide some kind of much-needed variation. But then the other the other thing that interests me is this really strong internal sense of groove that I think is provided by a yes. really talented drummer. So let's listen to, like, the first half or so of Panzer VI. So, uh, so drumming for this kind of black metal is really hard. Um, 
not just obviously you got to have insane stamina and speed, but the thing is, like as a drummer, especially in this style, I mean it's probably not unfair to say pretty much all the riffs on this record are like in the same key. It's the same general phrases getting worked around. Um, so you have to do what you can to provide variation while also keeping up on this insane tempo and with that level of aggression you need. So this guy's really smart because he's put so much energy into these sort of cascading fills that bridge riffs into each other really well. There's mm-hmm. the the whole strange way the main riff in the section operates where it, it'll play like three and a half times and then it abruptly shifts into a part B, kind of announced oh, by point. the drums. Yeah, yeah. that's a good Which point. is very difficult to make sound good. Uh, and overall, the drumming on this record is really stellar. I think he's using... It sounds like he's playing on an electronic kit because it sounds like those are samples, but he's it's clearly a person playing it because of just like little timing idiosyncrasies and stuff. But uh, I think that kind of makes it work. I like the uh, the really cold mechanical drum production. Oh, absolutely, yeah. When uh, I don't know that much about drums, I thought it was maybe triggered, but I thought I love the triggers. Well, um, it might it might be like sample replacement, but uh, like if you just listen to the snare, it's like. That's a sample, definitely, because that's exactly the same snare tone every time. So that's why I'm thinking Electronic Kid on this one. Well, this, so I so this band did a nice thing where they posted like little background stories of all their dudes on yeah. Instagram, uh, and uh, I guess they they have trouble finding drummers because most people can't play fast enough. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and this guy uh, played in a band called Jihad. Uh, and he's also a non-metal drummer uh, for uh, some pop and rock groups that I think are successful in Indonesia. Oh, that's um, cool. That's weird. So, I think the se- <laughs> so the secret is just have a really good drummer. Similarly, their vocalist is... Uh, he's in some throat singing ensemble that gets, like, arts grants and shit. Oh, okay. Um, and you can hear the throat singing vibe in his vocals. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, yeah, he's got so, the, it's that, uh, that nasal overtone post-ABBA thing. Mm-hmm. So I think part of this band's secret weapon is just have really talented people in your band. Yeah. And I think that suggests a cultural difference, which is like, uh, I don't know, it's like, you know, it's like, in, in America, like, if a dude who was in successful pop rock bands played in a black metal band, it would suck ass, right? Yeah, be like, yeah. It'd be like um, Dave Grohl joins Nactimistium on this next record, right? It'd be, <laughs> it'd be sort of dilettante shit, um, uh, or the people from the arts scene who get arts funding, right? Are the people who try their hardest to ruin black metal, right? yeah? Whereas here, these are like sort of like talented musicians for whom not just black metal, but like the 120 proof moonshine of black metal is like a native language. <laughs> Definitely. They didn't have to tell this guy to make a vest covered in patches. Yeah, he, he knew out. that was the right move. <laughs> he already had that. Yeah. He, um, but yeah, so, okay. Um, well, the other thing I want to mention... Anything else you wanted to say about... Oh, uh, well, yeah, yeah, just um, uh, kind of going back to you know, how I prefaced the track... Really strong sense of groove in this music. The mm-hmm. way it slides from those blast beat into those like hyper speed double bass passages is something that Marduk does all the time. And they really use that to great effect. I mean, it's a simple technique, but most people just can't pull it off as elegantly as these guys do, I guess. Yeah, this is very fluid music. If it mm-hmm. was, I, I mean, you can write something that's very similar to this that sucks. Because yeah, it's yeah. Just one ch- one chunk next to another chunk. And at least on Panzer Division, Marduk is more chunky than this is, and Marduk gets its sense of unity and drive from the riffing. Mm-hmm. I think a lot. Because but like this is so Yeah, like you said, you know, it's got the three and a half rep thing and it shifts and it's got this sort of um all these parts where all these parts where the drummers are doing these fluid fill, the drummers doing these fluid fills. Uh, also, what it, in addition to paying attention to power chords, this guy is really good at treming precisely in subtly different rhythms. Yeah, yeah. There's um, and he changes those rhythms within each song. 
Yeah, often, there's a lot of... Sometimes it, within a riff. It's all this nested, subtle, rhythmic variation that gives it a lot more life than it otherwise would have. So uh, next up, uh, I've, I've also got my second sample here. Uh, this is off Cold, uh, with a K and an H. And um, an H. <laughs> and uh, so, just to preface this one, hey, you got your immortal in my Marduk, buddy. <laughs> so uh, let's try this one out real quick. Sons of Northern Darkness. Dude, that those parts were sick. Right? Oh yeah, they're just it's... giant Bathory parts, like Nordland Bathory injected into a war metal song, and it's a great idea. The octaves on the chords on that first part, and mm -hmm. that kind of almost major key part, the, those get, that gave it a kind of Southeast Asian drone quality too, like a folk quality, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Just a bit. Um... I mean, Immortal uses a lot of octaves, too, but they sound different. That mm. second thing, though, oh my god. That... <laughs> yeah, it's pretty yeah, It's man. pretty enormous, man. It's a big old slab of ice coming right at you. It's, uh... So that's a... I think that's probably the, the biggest thing to emphasize for these guys are these very crisp and uh, sort of elementally simple but enormous melodic ideas. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I think, uh, I guess overall my, my idea is I think if these guys can make the songs a little bit more complex structurally, not too much, but just like a little bit more, a little more dynamic, um, and really emphasize the, uh, that juncture between these huge brash kind of immortal or bathroom melodic ideas with the really intense mechanical, uh, like kind of. Uh, minor Dorian stuff they're doing in the uh, blasting sections. I think that's a real identity to seize on. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I think this band definitely has a strong identity. Uh, yeah, like you were saying, they wouldn't want to add too much more because the extreme rigor is part of it. Mm -hmm. And they needed to write a record like this because this is them honing this one single idea. Yeah, but yeah, some some branching out more would not be would not be bad. I mean, these also are very clearly these are things that sound like generic riffs, but are not. This guy's taken a lot of time writing these riffs, I think, and picking them probably from a group of fifty riffs that sounded like this. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, also what and, this sounds uh, like, uh, just kind of an aside, but you mentioned it in your side of the notes. Uh, what it does sound like is. Impaled Nazarene. Uh, like a really rigorous early Impaled Nazarene in a way. Oh yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So it's, I mean, yeah, they're not just drawing on Panzer Division Marduk. They're drawing on the things that came before it, like Imp Naz and like uh, War Sweden. Yeah, I'm not familiar with them at all. Dude, that that is... um. That maybe we maybe we should just we, we don't need to pull a sample now, but what, what a band. Um, I gotcha. Uh... It's just extremely, like, gloriously stupid. Uh, and 
And the other lineage I think it's in, and this might relate to how they could build it out, as part of this kind of, like, I guess, more black metal-y war metal, uh, mm-hmm. Marduk's important for it, Morbid Angel's also important for it, yeah. uh, I would say, like, things that I'd put in this class would be that band Scythian I never stopped talking about. Yeah, yeah. That has, the <laughs> Scythian UK, that has these really epic sort of Bathory, Graveland melodies in it, um... Uh, Spearhead, Decrowning the Iron Arc, or Deathless Steel Command before that. I bet these guys listen to shit like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, also, probably Angel Corpse. I bet they like Angel Corpse, right? These are Pete Helmkamp. <laughs> um, Definitely, yeah. I could, I could see know, the Angel uh, Corpse thing. So, so all of those bands are a little bit more riffy and flamboyant than this. Mm-hmm. And, and using that kind of icy, immortal... Uh, meets Nidin quality would allow this band to get a similar playing that up a little more and playing up some of those deathy leads would allow them to step out alongside those bands a bit more. Yeah, definitely. Um, now, overall, well, I do like I've this got a lot. More... <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, it's it's this is pretty good fun. Um, yeah. And uh, and I think and it's got some depth to it because it's got this really intense idea at the heart of it. Yeah. Um. Uh. But so at the. At the end, they've got Death Hymn, Tribute to Euronymous. Um, there are a couple moments throughout this where I'd place Mayhem alongside Nidden and Immortal as influences here. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Ancient Hellfire is also, I think, quite catchy. Pardon me, Burp. And uh, <laughs> has some great Mayhem-y parts. But um, yeah. here, just like end of the record, big Mayhem tribute. Um, I'm not even going to play the mayhem sounding part for you guys. You can get the record and hear it. Yeah. But uh, this is just another one of those one chord moments. The break here. And also listen to the lyrics. It's just awesome. All right, let's yeah. do it. Everything is a, it's such a sharp angle in this music, you know? Yes, all sharp angles, yeah. That moment when they slow when they slow it to the, quote, slowest part on the record, which is yeah. that vicious downbeat <laughs> double bass thing, and he's just chiming the power chords over it. Uh, letting them ring, you're like, that is a power chord. Right. Yeah, it's like the gods. The gods you, gave us this power chord that we might smite their foes. Because you've got it's. Um, it's literally just like a two string, like inverted fifth power mm-hmm. chord, and it's like you, you've got the weird six eight break where he's just like chucking it there, and then it breaks into the double bass. It's like, well, there's going to be a new riff here. No, no, bitch. Quarter note one power chord over and over again. It's oh. it's so it's so ridiculous, and it works great. 
And, and then when, they, you know, yeah, it just gets this grand, it, it's majestic, I think. And then they bring back the blasting, and it gets another one of those big kind of immortal type melodies. And the vocals here are just, the vocal performance here is awesome. I, he says something like, listen to me, you mortal. Yeah. Right? Uh, you know, um, well, it's a, it, there's yeah. this whole like castigating thing because he he keeps saying "listen to me" and then he's following it up with something different every time. He's talking about like the beasts of men or something like that. Interesting, cool. I'll have to look at the lyrics more. Um, yeah, I mean, do you th- uh, do you think Euronymous would like this? Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think he'd appreciate the rigor of it, definitely. <laughs> Maybe not. It's it's not. Do you think he'd be shocked by how nicely produced it is? I think he'd be shocked by how fucking fast everyone is now. Yeah, it's um, I think I think Euronymous hears. I think Euronymous accepts this tribute. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, Death Hymn's fucking sick. I kind of have been looking for a band like this. I I look for bands like this all the time. Every time I click on a war metal band on the internet, I'm looking for a band like this and very rarely find them. Just so. something just rigorous and rigid and just casting you down, you know? And deep, sort of, yeah, profound and droning. And, uh, you know, like, in that way with Hate Forest, this band understands the infinite riff. Yeah, it's one power like, chord played forever. <laughs> This song doesn't even really... Even the end of the record, it's kind of just a fade-out thing. Just things keep happening right up to the very end. Mm -hmm. And you get the sense that when they turn it off, the band just keeps going. Yeah, yeah. It it does have that just, like, infinite battle quality that the best of kind of weirdo war metal or adjacent things, like, because Need and Division has that same quality of, like, it's just endless. You know? Yeah, yeah. As fate grinds on inexorable, the power just, chords ring out. As more, uh, as more, as more boys are sent to die, you know, it goes on. Oh, <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, as a, uh, that's a really good record. A lot of good records today. And uh, what have you got? Uh, what have you got to end on? What kind of note are we ending on here? Uh, this is a sample from a record put out by a. Where where are this where's this label from? Is this Mali? Is it, this is Indonesia, Central Java, Indonesia? This is a label called Kala Semati. We'll put it in the description, obviously, but it's mm-hmm. uh, K A L A C E M E T I. Um, I've seen it a little on Instagram, but this dude just randomly hit me up. Um, like many of the coolest people in metal, I don't think he really speaks English. Uh, and um, they, they only have one release. It's a release by a band called Mantash. It's a record called Samiri. The cover appears to be some scene from, you know, some sort of uh, Old Testament reference. It's got like Apis or, or, you know, something like that, or Yahweh as Apis or some sort of bronze bull in the desert. Um, and it is, <coughs> I played this for the death, I played this for the death metal guy a while ago, and he was just like, whoa, this is weird. This is like noise rock. Yeah, this is really bizarre stuff. Um, it's it, 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 it does not have a, a, uh, a, a good, easy reference point, you know? Yeah, it clearly comes out of the noisy black metal, noisy punky black metal thing, but this is just way, like plays that game much more seriously (laughs) yeah Um, so let's just click on samiri one uh and we'll use that to take it up take us out all right thanks a lot for listening guys we appreciate it as always and uh we will see you next week
Yeah.